Well, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. Fancy seeing you here again. Um, hope you're social distancing. This is uh, Franz Cantor here, cartoonist, illustrator, team talker, yada, yada, yada. And I'm going to do another drawing. And uh, today we're going to do this fellow. No, not her. We're going to do him. It's, um, he's a great, he's, uh, I love this guy. Um, I love this guy's work. His name is uh, Bill Plimpton, and uh, before I do anything else, I just thought I'd take this opportunity. We're going to talk about him today and his work. He's very prolific, but uh, you probably remember this from The Simpsons. Your face is like a song. Your sweet eyes whisper and I want to sing along. Features are in tune. <laughs> Let's sing together and turn every month to June. Your face comes, makes me a happy fella. No more singing a cappella. No. So we'll stop it right there. He is um, he is an awesome. Uh, uh, animator and a cartoonist and an illustrator and an, uh, caricaturist etc and um, his name is Bill Plimpton of uh, Plimp Tunes this is actually from an interview these are shots from interviews so I'll be working from not not <laughs> that's Barbara Steele I'll be working from uh, this photograph probably I think maybe this one this one here because he kind of looks <laughs> kind of looks like a, a naughty boy there all this sort of uh, unkempt hair and things. Um, it looks very like they just woke him up. He uh, He's responsible for some of the most uh, bizarre characters in animation and, you know, absolutely hypnotic and lovable. Um, he's an independent animator and, you know, he was uh, came to um the four i think uh in animation with a with that a cappella song not the simpsons version that's a that's a homage she did uh, to the original um uh, which she did for i think it was purchased by mtv but it was for like festivals and things and it uh created a big stir it was wonderful um yes make tunes itself so the idea is he's a he's an independent or an auteur animator um, very much influenced by, you know, um, the slapstick or, or great uh, animators from the past, like Tex Avery from, you know, Warner Brothers, and um, um, uh, also, you know, uh, characters like Daffy Duck and, and uh, Bugs Bunny, and of course, uh, in the Disney camp, uh, Goofy which uh, I'm also a big uh, fan of. He wasn't a fan of Hanna-Barbera, of course. That was like a limited animation. Um, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so he, is, he has this very quirky pencil style. And, you know, the um, it, it's a really unique form of animation. It, it, it's, it unfolds like, like a... Like a a car crash in slow motion. It's, they're wonderful to look at. Wonderful to look at. And uh, this is from Cheatin', an animated feature. Um, it's, it's just so, so great. Um, such great characters. This is him, of course. <laughs> he himself is... That's with one of the, the pencils, one of the uh, original frames, drawn frames which I think you can purchase from him. So he was born in 1946. He's an American animator, graphic designer, cartoonist, filmmaker. Um, and uh, he won an Academy Award nominated, well, and nominated for an Academy Award. Your Face, which uh, that I just played you, uh, is the Simpsons homage version, which he did for the uh, opening of the Simpsons show. Uh, I was born in Portland, Oregon, and um, I've um, I've been a great uh, lover of his work, and uh, his personal uh, sense of humor for many many years. So let's have a look at uh, his um, uh, 
Um, let's have a, a look at his face and see what we can glean from this uh, process of caricature. So I'm working on doing, I've done a little uh, thumbnail sketch here, which uh, was, you know, good fun. And um, I'm actually, the reason why I'm, I'm going to talk about Hanna-Barbera is because when I look at this, I kind of see some, you know, early faces of, uh, you know, Fred Flintstone or something. It's, it's just that sort of um, a three-quarter view shape. Um, almost needs a five o'clock shadow. So um, this, that's what I'm, I'm going to do. But I'm going to have a little bit of fun with it because, you know, it's inspiring. He inspires me and uh, I'm going to have a little bit of fun with this. So apart from talking about the construction of the face, um, I've j just taken the opportunity to re-sketch this thumbnail up on the brown paper. Uh, sorry, the grey paper, grey tone paper. And I just realised we can do some really funny things with this because um, I can bend and twist perspective a little bit. So even though it's a three-quarter view of the face, which means that um, the features are going to be in some form of, they're going to be related to perspective, right? So these sort of uh, horizontal references uh, that are facing away from us because it's a three-quarter view of the face, not a front-on view of the face. They're going to be referencing a vanishing point on a on an horizon. Okay, um, but we're going to play with it. We're going to sort of twist and turn this a little bit. So, um, and that's what I call almost like an expression-led um, uh, uh, thing. If you try to imagine like milk cows. Um, Beautiful animation on 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 um, Ale on uh, not Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan's um, pirate, uh, which we spoke about before, Captain Hook. You know, that's a good example of how drawings can um, be pushed to an expression, right? So this is sort of an expression. You've got a character looking at the side, and you can have something really cool, like a you know a um, An opening of the eye that def kind of defies, it's almost the opposite of uh, perspective, but it's a sort of a cockeyed <laughs> expression led uh, exaggerated pose, exaggerated uh, shape. So we're going to play with that a little bit, and I think that's going to be fun. Um, so I started to do that with this, and I'm just catching, some up, catching up some of the, uh, the details here. Now, you know, I've already established some shapes, as I said, based on Fred Flintstone, which, you know, I love, incidentally, uh, we'll talk about that now. Now, he doesn't like, um, he's, he's quoted as saying he grew up, you know, watching uh, Bugs Bunny and uh, Goofy and things like that, and uh, really didn't like the, the Hanna-Barbera limited animation uh, technique. And I, that's what I sort of grew up with. Um, so... I like Bugs Bunny, of course, and Goofy, but I also loved uh, Hanna Barbera. The reason why I loved Hanna Barbera was because the drawings were on screen long enough for me to draw. So they're actually they served a really uh, nice purpose for me because I could see them long enough on screen to be able to draw those uh, characters. Um, they weren't moving fast or quickly like uh, Bugs Bunny or Goofy which I absolutely adored, but, uh, you know, I couldn't draw them because they were too fast. So they served a purpose, uh, definitely, for, uh, for, for, in my mind, anyway. Um, and uh, I love them. And the character design um, is actually, you know, created for that limited animation. Um, I thought it was, uh, was really beautiful and, and aesthetically pleasing. So enough about that. Uh, let's talk more about uh, this process here and indeed um, Bill's work, Bill Plimpton. So he has a, a really unique um, style of animation and, you know, it's not limited animation uh, at all. It's it's like a pain in the ass animation, really. It's, it's quite, I mean, it's a beautiful animation, 
but it's really difficult because it's um, it's so um, time-consuming and uh, and um, in you know uh, quirky. It's 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 something that I couldn't imagine because it's so unique. I couldn't imagine anyone else really. Um, unless they're doing in-betweens or something, but even then they have to sort of really practice it because he, he was quite um, quite individually prolific. Um, so he'd do a lot of the uh, drawing himself for his films. So we've got like a... Uh, we're taking license here, um, which you do in animation or in cartoons. Um, in caricature, I'm, I'm kind of losing the position a little bit of the forms of the face, uh, hope, hoping that I will re-establish their, uh, their relevance in some form, in another, another position. So I'm kind of moving things around a little bit, twisting them, turning them. And hopefully get that sort of uh, Captain Hook um, effect. You know, pencil is really great for um, capturing texture of hair and also for skin. You know, and and the um, we forget that skin has this incredible um, variety of textures. You know, so there's like imperfections and, and things and smooth areas and shiny bits and you know matte matte areas and wrinkly soft areas and hard areas and things like that so it's quite a, a lot of variety in drawing uh, drawing faces and um, you know this uh, face in particular tells an awful lot there's a hell of a lot of study and um, what would you call analysis of the world um, which you, you, you would um, you would expect I guess from a master animator like uh, Mr. Plimpton definitely a lot of forces here so he has um, he has a singular vision you can see his um, his brows are uh, building up on one side, so it's it's not like an even-sided uh, perspective, you know. Like he doesn't. I don't think he suffers fools greatly. I don't think he has the the ability to sit on the fence. I think he's sort of very um, powerfully uh, opinionated, and. Um, Certainly about uh, animation, which uh, I find really interesting because it's um, it's that passion that uh, that keeps the staying power. You need staying power in animation because it is really hard. It's um, you know it's what I do here, like drawing uh, as an illustrator, but it's you know maxed by a hundred or a thousand. So there's a lot of drawing. And you have to be passionate and you have to be really in love with the concept, with the idea. And uh, he does that. He shows that. So look, look at these cheeks. They're brilliant, aren't they? They're so sort of fleshy. You just want to sort of grab them and blah, 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 blah. blah. You know? <laughs> um... Now I'm going to try to get this. Uh, the eyes are looking at the the side, so I want to try to get uh, and build up the that twistingness, that twistiness. Okay. Beautiful, uh, fleshy uh, quality. Excuse me. Excuse me.
lose my arm. Okay, so I'm going to keep the irises, or the shape of the irises quite similar. I'm looking back and forth at the eyes, trying to keep, even though I'm moving things around, keep an eye on the shapes, the individual shapes of elements of things, you know. So I'm changing the scale of things, like the eyebrows, etc. Um, but I want to keep the general directive and create this uh, dialogue between the different forms. So the eyes, the nose and the mouth, which is sort of this, uh, they create a beautiful um, gestural ballet of forms. One line leads into another, you know, around the, the muscles around the nose, the muscles around the, the eyes lead to the muscles around the nose, which lead to the muscles around the mouth. And then there are, there are opposing forces which pull and contract around the face itself. And all of this is sort of tissue that's, that's uh, stretched tightly over the skull itself. So, you know, this is, a, this is a monkey skull. I can't reach the human skull. But this, this will give you an idea of, um, you know, the cheekbones stick out and the forehead stick out because they're really close to the, to the skull, to the skin. And, um, you know, the flesh, the muscles and flesh and fatty tissue uh, that around the, the eyeball which sit in these orbits, these sockets, are um, really expressive. So they're not just designed to, you know, limit light or contract or expand to allow more light in. They're designed to... Um, Ex express thoughts and feelings and ideas and that's really peculiar to humans it's not an animal uh, trait at all you know so humans are bizarre in that uh, in that fact and um, really you know what I'm doing here right is a drawing but I am alluding to a real living breathing person and that's what I'm trying to capture it's trying to capture a sense a narrative sense of expression and personality so it's not just the likeness which I'm almost less concerned with at the moment um, I'm more concerned with capturing some essence of uh, personality and expression so this is a lot this is a lot of fun for me this is fun i've lost a bit of that uh, light in that side of the eye I'm just trying to think how i'm going to get it back um what i might do is uh move some of these things around so i can find my tools one tool in particular which I'm after, I can't seem to lay my hand on at the moment. There it is, staring me right in the face. Electric eraser. So these are good, they can um, wind back a lot of the, the pencil, revealing the grey tone underneath. Also want to lighten these um, shapes here, so that's good. Now, what we're using the brown pencil for here is building up tone, right? We're building up some structure, and we're going to be using the white pencil and the black pencil to create definitions, a sharper definition. So. You know, even ears have particular shapes so after they start to develop as adults, you know, in adult stage, rather than pupa, pupa <laughs> then oh, they develop definite, um, almost their own personality in a way, you know, thick and thinness and uh, 
some uh, peculiar uh, bumps and and furrows and things like that. So this general shape, you know, the shell-like ear shape, but uh, even within that, there is an incredible propensity for variety. And um, that's always important to reconcile that level of detail with a drawing. I always love that uh, that fact that you're doing a caricature of an ear, someone's ear. So it's not just the caricature of the face, it's, a, it's individual characteristics that you're actually playing with, toying with, learning learning about, you know. That's the thing about drawing, isn't it? Because we, we, when you draw, you learn. And, you know, and that's a, that's a great passion of mine is to learn, just to keep learning, just keep pushing the, the pencil around until you, you can't learn no more. So learn everything there is to learn, to know about Bill Plimpton's face. That's what I want to do. That's what this is for. We've got some white pencil here, which is going to help us establish a lot of the shine and build up, you know, a, a, um, a nice uh, contrasting um, effect. You can start to see it build up there. He's actually done three um, Simpsons openings. Um, they often have guest animators, you know, especially uh, famous ones like him, come on and do, you know, something. It's not so much, it's not a crossover, it's not like a family guy crossover, it's, it's more of a, a um, an homage because the Simpsons couch gag as it's come to be known, has become iconic in and of itself. Some great um, tangles of fur, of hair, sorry, fur. Some great tangles of hair which add to the drama, the mad scientist effect, you know. So this is, he's a lot of fun. There's some beautiful shapes here. I'm going to really enjoy actually building up the lighting on this side of the face too because um, you know, um, I'll just give you a little foretaste of what's to come here. There's some um, little shelves of skin and um, little wrinkles and furrows and things like that that the light's able to catch, catch um, and um, that's going to be really nice and dramatic. And I love pencils that are... This is a beautiful soft pencil, isn't it? This is a Prismacolor. Also use uh, polychromos, which are a bit harder. But uh, the white generally... Um, the softer Prismacolor can handle this uh, level of contrast quite nicely. Yeah. Now he's got blue eyes, as you can probably tell, but uh, um, under the lighting of this, um, these, these photos, um, they're quite dark. So that's just going to give me the ability to make them more sort of dramatic. Ooh. 
Oh, that's not nice. I messed up there a bit. The black pencil can help with the increasing the drama the contrast that I've been establishing with the uh, brown pencil. What a lot of fun his films are. I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen so many of them and um, they're really wonderful. I love watching them. I was playing them uh, last week to my students and, um, uh, you know, so I was introducing them to a new, a new, um, group of students and uh, really you know remarkable um, powerful documents these films okay all right so what are we doing now we need to get a bit of uh, a little bit of darker contrasts in there. Is this even working? Continue on. I haven't finished the wrinkles under here yet. I'm just really excited in the this uh, movement going on in the face that I've, I've been able to catch. So the likeness is a combination of a whole bunch of things, but I, th I find it more, more logical, more interesting to um, refer to the details of these little, you know, contours within contours, little muscles and things like that, wrinkles and stuff. The tiny details within the shapes that I've moved around. I find that really fascinating. And, you know, if it gets the job done, if it does, uh, you know, uh, indeed um, create the likeness, great. But I'm having fun anyway. So the journey is the, is the, um, is the most important part, not the destination. Not the destination. So let's always remember that. Ooh, look at these oh, incredible um, jowly um, lines here. These, the flesh is just sort of uh, incredibly making these, these beautiful furrows and valleys and 
mountains and things within the geography of the face here. So I'm going to tie, try to tie it in as much as I can to the features. So a lot of uh, muscles, because the muscles are all kind of interconnected underneath the skin, the wrinkles and things have a general um, connectivity to them. So the gestural lines that, uh, that you find within the rhythms and the, the, um, uh, the contours of these lines around the shapes that delineate the shapes, um, uh, you know, they're, they're very, very interconnected. So um, it's always a, a great um, sense of accomplishment when, you know, you're, it's like you're drawing a line on a map and you're saying, where am I going? And, and then all of a sudden you're in familiar territory, right? So the, the line finds its way home. <laughs> How's that? That sounds funny, doesn't it? But in essence, that's what, what's happening. So these lines are finding their way home. And the home is Bill Plimpton. All right, so now we've got uh, to make a decision regarding the top lip here because there's a tightening of this lip and kind of looks like it's... Uh, you know, he, he has a sense of humor which is quite sarcastic. And you can tell from his face. But, you know, the films that he makes are, are really, they're fantastic um, exercises in social comment. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking of a recent uh, film that I saw of his, which was Guard Dog, which is a really cool. It's a bunch of almost unrelated um, shorts about a dog and different careers. It's a career dog, right? Guy dog and guard dog and all that sort of stuff. So it's all the different adventures and things and, you know, and, and things that can go wrong. Anything that can go wrong goes wrong, but goes wrong spectacularly. And uh, he has this incredible overstatement of the gag. So not only will the gag go wrong, but it'll go wrong in an epic scale, in an epic fail way. And, uh, you know, which is part of the, um, uh, part of the sense, part of his sense of humor. That's his shtick, that's his, um, You know, I mean, if you look at uh, Warner Brothers or Goofy, that's in essence what it is, isn't it? So it's an, it's an exaggeration and, a, and an acceleration of mistakes, of epic fails, things that can go wrong, that build up one upon the other. So that um, the Academy nominated short that he did, um, which is in the uh, Simpsons film that I showed you before. That uh, those gags get they build up on an, on one another, so they they just get more and more and more um, exaggerated, and and that uh, you know increases the tension of the gag itself of the uh, the film, which just makes it funnier. Often time, I think it's it's one of those things with comedy that uh, you, know, you build up the tension and the, and the the joke is the release of that tension. So that's what makes it uh, work. Cool. Okay. Let's keep keep the uh, the drawing happening here. Let's see if we can. Work out this uh, lower lip. So you've got some teeth that are multi directional as well. 
teeth-like ears. You know, they're um, they're beautiful things to caricature uh, because they have they have again like the ears. They have a basic structure, but they have individual differences, and those individual differences are really fun. some going in that way and then some catching the light here and then there's a narrowing like a curvature of the, the teeth it's this uh, oh, excuse my reaching so uh, if you can match this to this there's a curvature right of the teeth that's what we're trying to indicate. Beautiful shape here. Don't know what this means. Ooh, what's going on here? Hang on a second. Let me find this. Something's happened. Um, I need to reform this uh, relationship. Let's see what we can do here. Okay. Um, so what I've done here, I've, I've moved things around that um, they've lost their actual connections, they've missed their bus stop, they're, so I'm trying to re-establish a, a, a relationship that makes sense. Okay, I think we could probably stand that. Let's try to get those wrinkles in there. And these beautiful um, jowls here. That probably makes it work better. There is a, a tendency, there's a sort of a light that's coming in from the top left-hand side, which we're referring to. Um, a little bit and um, of course there's some bounce lights coming in from the right as well which uh, which can help establish the feeling of three-dimensional form so light and shade create a sense of three dimensions Three dimensions are great things, especially when they're coming out of a, a grey paper, toned paper like this. It's quite a nice uh, thing to happen. I like that, that's good. Um, there's a bit of uh, form missing from this area. And I'll try to get it 
right amount of uh, shine. So this sort of this is where the lights there's some oil glands or something the part, that part of the skin the other thing I wanted to oh I need to reflect you know it's great um, the um, well, I won't pull, it, pull the thing out again but whenever you can if, if you can refer to the cheekbones because the cheekbones and the cranium are very close to the skin so even if they're not greatly strongly featured in the drawing in the sorry the reference um, it's an idea to build them in if you can you know because it gives your drawing a sense of uh, believability and grounded groundedness in um, the realistic anatomy So like the expression, all roads lead to Rome, all forms, all wrinkles have a, a directional property. And uh, they direct from, they direct around landforms, around under superstructures like the, uh, the cheekbone. some fun with the, the light over there. We've got also some pens here, paint markers, which are fantastic for establishing um, some little uh, hot spots of light. So these are going to be good because they tend to give us a little bit more um, sparkle in areas that we want it. This is good. Let's try to build up that uh, rim light coming down from the right. Yeah. Could build up a bit more shine here. And I think we're going to try to get that side light over there. Kind of picks out the, picks the nose. So. Bit of shine over there on the beard line. If you haven't watched, there's some great interviews of his, some um, documentaries of him uh, on YouTube. If you haven't watched them, you should because they're really fun. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they kind of explain his take on animation and his love of animation and how, you know, the passion drives you, definitely. It's a passionate uh, experience. So, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware that the, um, we're talking about a likeness here, but you, forgive me for being excited about the, the opportunity to twist and pull things around, right? So it's like silly putty, you know, it's great fun. And uh, I really enjoy that opportunity with faces, you know. There's so much to draw. There's so much to to find. It's sort of like picking a fight, but you know you're going to win somehow. You know you've got a great move coming up. There's there's a kick to the gonads coming, and you practice it. So you you know even if you win, you lose the war, um, I could lose the the fight with. Uh, 
with this picture. You know, it, it could very well end up that it's not going to look enough like him. But I don't care. <laughs> this, is, this is like so much love, love, uh, you know, in this face um, that I'm picking up. There's so much. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. And I can, you know, in, in doing this, I can kind of get really an understanding of why you would punish yourself so much with this uh, a career in animation as an auteur. You know, it's one thing being an animation director like a John Lasseter or something, or you know, but why would you take on very particular illustrative style that um, can only really be done by you or, you know, with very, very close scrutiny, like a backseat driver effect over the shoulder of, of uh, an animator that has a similar um, concept of uh, form and, and um, color and texture, etc. I think they use um, Prismacolors as well. Prismacolors is kind of like a, an illustrator's um, go-to tool, traditional illustrator's go-to tool. They do, they're very soft, they're nice, so they, you know, you can, they have good coverage and um, the pigment's very good quality. This is nice. It's got a nice, uh, a nice sense of um, um, contrast and variety within these shapes. So I like this very much. I'm going to lean over on this side now, so I grab this uh, this picture. Uh, probably uh, I can hit the outlines a little bit with a pen. To strengthen them, I think I might do that. Um, but this is a lot. Of, this is so much fun. Yeah, sometimes you have a um, an idea that fully forms, springs out of the paper almost um, in a way. So it's very exciting, and that's that's what happened with this. Um, you know, I had a basic idea with a thumbnail, but uh, until I sort of blew it up and you know started to redraw those shapes, and why I love them, um, and I tried to uh, capture the the essence or the likeness of the of the person of the character. Um, and explore, uh, you know, variety variety of, of shape. And we start with a simple shape, like a peanut head or something, you know, um, Fred Flintstone head, uh, which is what this is. <laughs> oh, and, uh, that would upset him. Um, so, I don't think he... I don't think he said anything about the design of the Flintstones. It's just that limited animation had limited opportunities for, um, you know, for the uh, for the movement and the expression of the characters and the weirdness, of course. But it's not as fluid as, you know, Bugs Bunny. But I think the character designs are. Hanna-Barbera, early Hanna-Barbera, like, you know, up until um, Scooby-Doo. Of course, after that, I refused to watch them. It was just sort of like replicating the same old, same old, and I couldn't see a point, really. It's almost like they, they came up with, uh, you know, this pantheon of characters. It's like the Warner Brothers thing, you know, they had... Um, so many characters they came up with, and then they sat on their hands. They didn't invent anymore.
which is terrible. It's such a waste because, you know, the, the artists were still pumping them out. They were still around. They were still interested and motivated. It's just that they, I think the business side of the business um, crushed it. So Hanna-Barbera dominated um, television cartoons for about nine years. I wouldn't say ten years, but be careful because... If it takes in, in Funky Phantom and Hair Bear Bunch, watch out. You know? Um, I think um, Banana Splits just made it in time, you know, with uh, um, Shazam and... Uh, um, what was the... Uh, yeah, not the live action stuff, the cartoons. Um, Three Musketeers and things like that. But it kind of just made it in, but uh, the rest of it just bleh. After that, I remember, I remember the sense of shock and disappointment that I had as a kid. You know, oh, there's a new show, Funky Phantom. And then I saw about 10 minutes of it and then instantly um, revulsed and that was it and they couldn't do it again they couldn't um, didn't work for me anymore it's kind of sad but they had good you know from rough and ready onwards they had a good nine years from 1960 to 1969. So, and some memorable uh, cartoons. Some memorable cartoons. So, I mean, not I'm talking about the characters. So not I'm not saying that they're great animation. They're not. But the character designs, I thought, were really cool. Beautiful shapes here. Okay, let's get into some of this. Uh, okay, we're going to getting down into the nitty gritty down here. This is a soft tissue, and um, this is very interesting. This is like you like turtle necks? Well, here's a turtle neck for you. Um, so it's a very soft tissues here, and. Um, you know, in an elderly gentleman, they <laughs> sort of become these incredibly um, versatile. Um, they take on a life of their own and a jiggleness and a beautiful sense of um, character, don't they? I'm thinking of uh, in Kung Fu Panda. You know that great character of the uh, turtle and how that um, oh, I just loved it so much the the, um, the way that the, the head would shake you know from old age and and it just had a, a, a level of truth that I found wanting in a lot of 3D animated uh, films including Pixar films so I, you know, really enjoyed it. Okay, so we've got a lot of little spider details coming up here. So that's interesting. Now, I'm trying to create a... I just want to put something simple in here as a shirt. I want to sort of over, overdo the, the details too much. But it's important because it it has to feel has to feel right. Okay. 
so I'm changing the uh, what I see in the in the reference a little bit. It's kind of an offset, you know, but it's good fun. I'll just heavy up these uh, contours here and create a bit of more character. Some more character. That's what we need. It's got a beautiful pencil style, um, and I used to love his. Uh, I used to do uh, caricatures in. There's another guy called uh, Brodman who used to do caricatures for I think Rolling Stone, and um, he did some as well. And I love those guys. At the time, I wasn't using a lot of uh, pencil. I was sort of using watercolor because it was a bit faster for coverage. Um, and I have yet to discover this, which is a Prismacolor. So I'd often heard illustrators talk about Prismacolors. Even airbrush artists were aware of them well, way before me. And I kind of found these little fellows, the, the polychromos. And the polychromos are good because you can lay a line down and then put watercolor over the top, which was a lot faster than oil paint. Took a bit of uh, getting used to the process, but after that, you know, it was like, no. Um, beats oil paint for most, uh, you know, illustrative tasks. And uh, then you, you know, the details over the top you would uh, use with um, white gouache and uh, or other like whiter, yeah, white gouache and things and prismac, not prismacolors, but uh, Derwent's or softer pencils and things like that. For some reason, I I don't know whether the art store that I had um, didn't have them or you know there was a couple of different versions of. Prismacolors, these are called premieres. So I'm not sure the reason, but uh, I came upon these um, quite recently, actually, and now I love them. I, th I think they're great. I don't know if I would do a whole illustration using these because they are soft, but they do have good coverage. You can see with the building up of, uh, you know, highlights in this uh, drawing, um, it can do it quite well, you know. You can handle a lot of different uh, paper textures as well. It, um, you can work on watercolor paper, hot press, cold press, watercolor paper uh, very well. So there's a sort of a, a, a translucency in the nose, you know, there's um, and also in the ears, a certain sort of glossiness and, uh, all, and a kind of a transparency. It's like if you, if you shine lights from behind it, you obviously get pink, a uh, pink effect. Um, so it is translucent. Um, very much so. So I'm using the YT. I'm going to try and, I'm, I'm not coloring in, I'm just establishing what I have there um, in the drawings, but uh, it's, it, you know, exaggerating a little bit. So I'm getting the, building up the contrast a little bit better. Um, and having the, uh, he's got so many moles and things on his face, they're great to sort of draw them out. Um, gives it a, a, a definite um, realistic skin effect, skin texture, which is nice. And I kind of went a little bit crazy with the, the 
you know, the, the one one closed eye and one open eye. And it probably would have, uh, it would have been better if I had mi um, mirrored that in the eyebrow itself. But uh, I think uh, um, for what it is, it works at the moment. I think it works quite well. That's the under part of the jowls there, so that wouldn't be catching that much light. Um, the light would be kind of spilling and then reforming down at the, the bottom part of the neck, down in towards the shoulder. So I think we'll build up a bit more light down there. So there's a sense of variety of textures and shine, and um, you know that's nice to build up. Let's try to get those um, stubborn white regrowth hairs down here. Tell this bit of uh, shininess happening down there too. Let's maybe put a little bit of down there, maybe. Don't know. Clean up that little bit. Let's resort to this, shall we? Back to the grey paper. See how it cleans it, polishes. It's a polishing effect, isn't it? Reminds me about the dentist. I have to, I have to go back to the dentist. Sorry about that, Chief. It's reminding you guys about dentists and drills. I actually love dentists. I don't know why. This is something very fulfilling about getting fulfilling. Get it? Fulfilling about getting the uh, getting your choppers fixed, and I hate haircuts. I just don't like it. There's something about being touched around the back of the head or something. I just don't like it. It's creep creepy. Someone sneaking up on you. But dentists are good. Some nice shine there. Some having a lot of fun with this. I must say, it's a, what a beautiful subject. Um, you know, these uh, this reference material. I was looking at all of the stuff that that he'd done, and uh, and then I was watching a YouTube um, interview. And in the YouTube interview, I thought, well, he's got some really, he's let go, you know. So he hasn't got that controlled, zany expression that he has in his publicity photographs. But he's sort of a natural zany. <laughs> he's a natural madman. So I've got that mad genius uh, in, in that expression. And uh, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was waiting for. So, you know, that's the photograph that, uh, that I... I work from, so it's not the official um, Plimpton shtick, but it's the shtick behind the stage, behind the stage. Uh, just clean up this ribbon here, the name ribbon. I like that uh, concept a bit. What's the point? What's the point? What's the point? But, uh, there we go. Let's that's, that's, um, clean this up a little bit more.
So he hasn't um, retired like um, my other animation hero, Ralph Bakshi. He's, he's still in the business. So still doing stuff. Still in festivals and collections and things. So, you know, some great stuff. Oh, why did they do that? You know, there's a, a thin pencil. Sometimes you have to be careful. It, it can pick up other pigment and then lay it down and then you've you've stuffed up this is a lot of fun okay all right we're going to get into the brush now again. This is a zig uh, brush, and it's got the pigment in the handle, and you press it, and it comes out. And it's like tomato sauce, so, you know, first nothing comes out, and then a lot of And you shake, shake, shake the ink bottle. Be careful. So I'm also going to be using a uh, Posca uh, marker as well, probably a black. So what I want to do here is uh, create a uh, little bit more contrast uh, drama in the um, in the light and dark. Okay. Also, we're going to color in the background. And the background I've established with this sort of framed space around it. And that's something that comes from looking at a lot of Drew Struzan illustrations because they have a sort of a, it's kind of a locking device in a way. It locks the action of the illustration in place on the page. Otherwise, it'll be floating around like weightless. This was um, when I was working for newspapers. Um, I used to find this part, the, the last part of the illustration process very satisfying because it's um it's like you know you're a kid with a pair of scissors cutting out shapes that's what it reminded me of so this great sense of uh, accomplishment and fun everything else before that was like you know especially dealing with you know, politicians and things. John Howard. No offence, but like after drawing hundreds of, uh, not hundreds, but dozens and dozens of Howards, um, I lost my taste for, for it. So I would often cleanse my soul by as while I'm there at the paper, I would draw anything else, anything else, a caricature of somebody else for nothing, for free, for, you know, just for the, the, the sense of accomplishment that I got from having to focus on the, yet another caricature of somebody boring boring old politics. There's a little bit of rhythm, a little bit of bumpiness in that line, but I think uh, I will suffer it. Okay, so let's bring this down here. I'm going to cut in with this brush. Now, I'm just going to prove to you something because you know, this ink, it's not like Indian ink. 
it's a calligraphic ink so it's a bit more fluid but it dries beautifully flat Indian ink has a tendency to pool and create a uh, uneven glossiness in some areas it dries unevenly and this ink dries quite nicely like something else which I'm going to use in a second which is a Posca marker so years ago you may be thinking well why don't you use a marker black marker no 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 black markers um, they tend to not only do they um, go patchy and uneven but they have an annoying uh, trait of bleeding through the paper even thick paper like this this is about 200 200 gsm 210 i think so the uh, markers tend to be too uncontrollable as well so they go streaky but this ink doesn't this ink goes really well and you know you can put it's like it's um light fast and water fast so you can put watercolor if you so desire over the top so it's like a spirit marker as well so you can see I've actually outlined that a bit now I'm going to hit it with a bigger thicker here pen this is a Posca pen and um, it's beautiful you can ride on bus seats with this not that you want to but I'm just saying because you know it can it's not permanent like a texture like a marker but it is in this case it dries very flat it's perfect for this because it doesn't go through the paper and dries flat which is a you know a great boon because you can start with a brush pen and finish with this and it won't look like it's two different pens it won't be streaky it dries beautifully and flat this is another Oscar marker it's a white one they come in I put they come in many colors but I buy a lot of them in black and white and sometimes they come in brush um, as well we didn't use brush uh, this time but uh, we could have So that's going to dry nice and uh, flat. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, that color, so I won't worry about it too much. So let's. Um, he's a you know brilliant, brilliant, brilliant animator, animation director, storyteller, master storyteller. The stories that he tells are really interesting. This character, the you know the guard dog, um, is a really beautiful tale lovely personality so yeah this is some of his shorts you know giving up smoking and won an award for that that's um the uh academy award academy nominated uh, short the, the uh, i think what it's called the lonely this is a guard dog the king of indie animation how to make how to sell cartoons without selling out so so much um, fantastic so many great ideas and of course his illustrations had the same amount of energy and, and capriciousness as well that was Barbara Steele um, so yeah there you go that's um, uh, Bill Plimpton 
the great Bill Plimpton. And um, this is my version of Bill Plimpton. So it's, I don't know whether it looks enough like him. Kind of, sort of does, I think. But um, I really enjoyed the uh, opportunity. Some beautiful shapes there and uh, expressions. This may be a little bit of channeling of Lon Chaney. <laughs> my, uh, I love his, his face as well, but um, definitely, you know, there is a, um, a story to be told in faces and in Bill Plimpton's face. And uh, I'm just sort of, it, it was a great pleasure to be part of this, uh, this lovely um, exercise, which is what it is. All right, so this is um, uh, Bill Plimpton and this is Franz Cantor. And I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.